Part C, Directions. In this part of the test, you will hear several talks and answer questions about them. While you listen, you will see the answer choices for the questions that follow. After you hear each talk, you will hear the questions one at a time, and you will see the answer choices on the screen. After you hear a question, read the answer choices and click on the best answer to the question. Answer the questions on the basis of what is stated or implied by the speakers in the talks. You will hear the talks and the questions about them only one time. Here is an example. Listen to a professor talk to his class about a television program. I'd like to tell you about an interesting TV program that will be shown this coming Thursday. It'll be on from 9 to 10 p.m. on Channel 4. It's part of a series called Mysteries of Human Biology. And the subject of the program is the human brain, how it functions and how it can malfunction. Topics that will be covered are dreams, memory, and depression. These topics are illustrated with outstanding computer animation that makes the explanations easy to follow. Make an effort to see this show. Since we've been studying the nervous system in class, I know you'll find it very helpful. Now, listen to a sample question. What is the main purpose of the program? On the screen, you read A. To demonstrate the latest use of computer graphics. B. To discuss the possibility of an economic depression. C. To explain the workings of the brain. D. To dramatize a famous mystery story. The best answer to the question, what is the main purpose of the program, is C. To explain the workings of the brain. Therefore, the correct choice is C. Now, listen to another sample question. Why does the professor recommend watching the program? On the screen, you read, A. It is required of all science majors. B. It will feature the professor's research. C. It can help viewers improve their memory skills. D. It will help with coursework. The best answer to the question, why does the professor recommend watching the program is D. It will help with coursework. Therefore, the correct choice is D. Now, we will begin Part C with the first talk. Click Next to go to the next screen. Questions 38 through 41. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Gorillas spend most of their lives in heavily forested areas, and until recently it was thought that they had an aversion to water. But it turns out that at least one species in West Africa actually spends a lot of time in a swamp. And while they're in the swamp, the males often engage in dramatic splash displays. What they do is they jump into the water, and that makes a big splash, and large plumes of water shoot up. These behaviors haven't been seen in any other species of gorilla. Some species of chimpanzee, which are smaller than gorillas, have occasionally been observed throwing rocks into the water, you know, to create a splash. But even that's very rare. The researchers observing all this splashing wondered what its purpose was. One thing they noticed was that the displays are done mostly by mature males, leaders of family groups. The researchers deduced that a male gorilla probably engages in this splashing as a show of aggression toward other family groups, especially toward males in other family groups, to warn them to stay away from members of his own family group. The males engage in the splashing even when there are no females around, so it doesn't seem intended to attract females. Researchers think the displays in the water are probably an extension of gorilla displays on dry land. In the forest, males spend a lot of time flapping their arms, strutting around aggressively, beating their chests, charging other males, and so on. Number 38. What is the talk mainly about? Number 39. What do most gorilla species generally avoid?
Number 40. According to the professor, how do gorillas create splash displays? Number 41. What is the likely purpose of splash displays? Questions 42 through 46. Listen to part of a lecture in an archaeology class. For over a century, archaeologists have been excavating a site at an ancient river port in Italy called Portus. Portus was a major port for the capital, Rome, and ships unloaded a wide range of goods there. Food, building materials, luxury items. Excavations have revealed a lavish ancient palace complex at Portus, which was probably used by a high-status official like a port administrator. In the 19th century, a detailed map of the Portus Palace complex was created by Rodolfo Lanciani, who excavated many of the ruins from ancient Rome. On his map, Lanciani marked the remains of a particular structure in the complex, but Lanciani found only half of the structure, and his interpretation of its original shape and function turned out to be wrong. This structure has been rediscovered by archaeologists, who have determined that it was an amphitheater, a half circle of seats overlooking a stage. Now, ancient Roman amphitheaters were usually large enough to accommodate tens of thousands of spectators, but the size and location of Portus's amphitheater suggests it was used for smaller private gatherings, not open to the general public. The amphitheater has raised a lot of questions. An amphitheater in a location like this is pretty unusual. What was it used for? Port business? Maybe the port administrator used it to address workers. Or perhaps the emperor visited the Portus Palace complex and military games and mock battles were staged there. Number 42. What does the professor mainly discuss? Number 43. What was discovered at Portus? Number 44. What contribution by Rodolfo Lanciani does the professor mention? Number 45. How does the Portus Amphitheater differ from other ancient Roman amphitheaters? Number 46. What does the professor say about the use of the Portus Amphitheater? Questions 47 through 50. Listen to part of a lecture in a United States history class. Early agriculture in California was quite different from what it was on the East Coast. Since the U.S. population was initially concentrated in the East and then moved westward, California, which is on the West Coast, was still sparsely settled until the mid-1800s. That changed when gold was discovered there in 1848. When word about the discovery spread, there was a major gold rush and people poured into the state. But later, California's entrepreneurs turned their focus to farming. Now, I'm not talking about small family-owned farms like the ones back east. I mean, land in California was cheap, so farms there actually began as extensive commercial enterprises. Although some crops were sold locally, farmers aggressively pursued markets overseas and in the eastern United States. Initially, wheat was sold to Europe. Later, after the railroads crisscrossed the entire country, California began shipping fruits and vegetables to the colder climates in the east. These huge farms demanded a lot of skills, and the expertise that developed yielded all sorts of innovations that made farming more efficient and productive. Sophisticated harvesting equipment, new food processing and preservation techniques. California farmers also created new varieties of crops and new ways to control pests. But it wasn't always easy. California's climate is pretty dry, so one major challenge was getting water to the fields. 
Farmers join together in cooperatives to construct big irrigation systems. There were occasional conflicts over who had the right to use the water, but for the most part, farming in California proved very profitable in the long run. Number 47. Why does the professor mention the California gold rush? Number 48. How does the professor characterize California's early farms? Number 49. What does the professor emphasize about California's farmers? Number 50. What disadvantage of farming in California does the professor mention? This is the end of the listening section.